recording starting. Uh, good morning, everyone that is joining us in this time zone. It is 9 uh, a.m. and two, two minutes past 9 a.m. here in Melbourne. It is a pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this short course on operating envelopes and their implementation. This is the first day uh, of the course. Uh, today we have three blocks, uh, around 55 minutes each. Uh, my name is Nando Cho. I'm a professor of smart grids and power systems. And uh, this particular hour, uh, Arthur or Dr. Arthur Gonzalez Divisias is joining us today to help with the Q&A. Uh, before we start, I just would like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners uh, of all the lands we are on today, particularly here at the University of Melbourne and all the campuses where they are situated. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Now, this is the outline of uh, today's block number one. Uh, I will just tell you very briefly, like kind of housekeeping uh, about this short course, uh, have some stats about the registration, which is very interesting. Uh, we will move then to the Australian context. We, as you will see, uh, we have a lot of people that are joining us, not necessarily right now online, live, but uh, will be uh, using the material that are from outside Australia. Actually, 45% of the registrations are from outside Australia. And to really understand operating envelopes, you need to understand the Australian context, and how much solar photovoltaics we have. Um, so that is a very important component. For our Australian colleagues, uh, just bear with me. I, and I think it is just good to, to reflect on you know, what is the Australian context uh, for which now we have operating envelopes. Now we will move to the operating envelopes as a concept, the benefits, super quick, but some interesting slides perhaps, and some of the challenges. Yes, some of them, because actually there are many, many, many challenges. Uh, we will be discussing those challenges, uh, some of them uh, today in block one, then in block two, then in block three as well today, and uh, tomorrow as well, we will continue with many other challenges, uh, the actual challenges, you know, by companies such as uh, Energy Queensland and uh, South Australian Power Networks that will be presenting tomorrow as well. We will present today as well in block one, the ideal calculation of operating envelopes. And uh, this is just to say that uh, if you want to capture the physics as accurate as possible, the only way of doing it is with electrical modes. The, re the reality is that it is extremely difficult to put them together for different reasons. And uh, what the idea of this ideal calculation is just to present what would be the benchmark. But we will discuss what other uh, potential implementations uh, can be done in the next block, actually, with Arthur. I will present relatively briefly a case study, which is Project H. Uh, this is a project funded by, by ARENA, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. And this project finished last year. And uh, fantastic results, very interesting experience. The University of Melbourne was involved, uh, many organizations as well. This was led by AIMO and OSNET Services. And I'm gonna share just a tiny bit of what we did there, but uh, really mainly just to, to give you a glimpse of what, what Spray Edge about and the outputs and uh, uh, some, of, some of the interesting challenges. Um, but there's much more and there are multiple webinars Spray Edge. So we're just gonna really just present a tiny overview. And then I'll finalize with some key remarks. Before we continue, please note that uh, there's this Q&A uh, option that you have. So you can actually uh, talk to us uh, there. We will be looking at it if there's any problem with the slides or the audio or something. But also if you have any question don't wait until the very end to raise your question. Feel free to just write it down. I will go through uh, the questions at the very end of this block. So the presentation will last around 40 something minutes, 45 perhaps. So we will have time for uh, the Q&A. And we will try to do this in every block so we can actually interact with you and you can answer, uh, we, we can answer your doubts. Let's move on. So about the course. Uh, so first of all, we have a very nice selection of instructors. So we have Arthur that is joining us right now. Uh, Pierluigi uh, will be delivering block number three today. Alex and Liam, they are well, from Energy Queensland and South Australia Power Networks uh, respectively. They will be tomorrow in block one, sharing their experiences of the actual implementation of operating envelopes or more specifically flexible export limits in the corresponding companies. These are distribution companies here in Australia. Uh, Jean will be joining us tomorrow as well, uh, explaining a little bit about 
flexible import limits. So <laughs> that's a, a quite a interesting topic as well. So it's not just about exports, it's also imports, and that's the idea of operating envelopes. Uh, Vini Vincenzo will also be discussing what opportunities are with data and uh, where it is possible to do relatively accurate uh, calculations, you know, of operating envelopes uh, without electrical models. And well, me here. So we are uh, your instructors and uh, the topics that we're going to address, as you already know, you know, from the emails and the brochure, but just to do a quick recap, today we're going to go through the basics this particular hour. Then we will move to different operating implementations. As much as, you know, we would like to uh, do something very accurate, the reality is that companies, distribution companies, are unlikely to be able to do electrical models, particularly of their low voltage networks, the pulse and wires connecting our homes and businesses. Uh, so they will need to come up with something else, right? Uh, actually, they're already coming up with something else, which is pretty good because we need to make some progress with this. Uh, but we will discuss you know, these potential implementations and what are the potential implications of losing accuracy as well. So we'll be discussing this in the next hour. In block three, we will have the bigger picture delivered by uh, Luigi. And the idea here is to really think about the services that we're unlocking with operating envelopes, uh, aspects of fairness as well. So it's a very interesting block that really finishes the more conceptual aspects uh, of day one and operating envelopes. In day two, we will go for a little bit of the actual implementation of operating envelopes in Energy Queensland, which is in Queensland, <laughs> it's the north of uh, Eastern Australia, and in South Australia as well, uh, South Australia Power Networks. So these are the two distribution companies that are right now offering uh, flexible export limits to customers uh, in their initial stages. And uh, of course, they have a lot to, to share with us. Um, we will have also a discussion of what is to have operating envelopes as business as usual. There are really a discussion of different challenges, what happens with uh, import limits, uh, what happens with actually having the exploitation of data to achieve more accuracy without electrical models. And then in block three, we will have a little bit of a hands-on operating envelope calculations with repositories that we have. So I will explain um, uh, all this uh, code that is publicly available that can be used by you all to really learn how it is the calculation of operating envelopes. Uh, each block will be around 55 minutes, including Q&A. So we will always have a five minute break so, so we can stretch, all right? Uh, there's a question there that says uh, that we, if we have a need an engineering background for this course, uh, well, a little bit, a little bit, it would be ideal, uh, definitely. But uh, in general, many of the concepts, uh, you, you don't need to be an engineer to really understand it. Uh, so, so you will be okay. Um, however, of course, if you want to go through the code that we're gonna do tomorrow, then yeah, that's gonna be, uh, a, a requirement for sure, otherwise it will be a little bit challenging. All right, so about attendees today. So we have more than 700 uh, attendees, not online precisely. Right now we have uh, around 160 people online as expected, because of course it's just gonna be a fraction and people will be uh, looking at uh, all this material offline because they will be uh, on Canvas. They're available to you all for a few more weeks. 55% uh, of the attendees are from Australia. The rest are international, of course. And the mix in terms of, you know, industries and universities or so research centers is quite interesting. So we have a very, very nice mix from different parts of our world, but also covering industry and academia, which is great. Now, in terms of Canvas, uh, you all have received the corresponding invitations. Uh, you receive an announcement that must have gone through your email as well, depending on your settings. Um, we might do other announcements, not, not many to be very honest. Uh, but it's a, a, a way of just reaching out to you all. Uh, we will have discussion boards as well, where you can actually raise questions for specific topics, and we will try to do our best to answer them. Uh, being hundreds of people can be challenging, but I think it is doable. And then you will have the modules where you will have all the different information for, for not just uh, the, the, the Zoom links, et cetera, but the video recordings are gonna be there, the slides, et cetera, okay? All right, so let's start. Uh, that was a little bit of housekeeping. Let's start because now I have a lot of content to share with you all. Uh, there's a question here for Tim. Uh, you have mentioned dynamic export limits uh, since they are actually both export and import envelopes. Yes, that's correct. However, what it is officially, uh, what can be done by distribution companies in Australia is just flexible exports. All right, I will explain that, all right? 
Now, uh, what is the context of Australia? Uh, right now, I mean, we're in 2024, but 2023, the peak net demand uh, was around 32.5 gigawatts of the national electricity market. That's the eastern half of Australia, the, the right half. Uh, in terms of photovoltaics, more than 32 gigawatts uh, worth of installations and millions of installations, which actually means it is not really about solar photovoltaic farms. It's about many small scale residential, particularly uh, installations. Almost one in three houses in Australia has photovoltaics, more than 2 million uh, uh, out of uh, 10 million installations. So which is a uh, quite, quite big, all right? Uh, the average size in 2023 has increased to around nine kilowatts actually as a matter of fact. So pretty big installations as well. In terms of residential batteries, we have more than 180,000 uh, batteries as well. So this is the context, all right? Which means we have a lot of solar photovoltaics. We have all colors farms as well. And there's uh, a lot of batteries as well. Not as many, there's not millions, but it is increasing. What this all means, what this all means is that our generation mix has a lot of solar photovoltaics. Uh, these, these plots are uh, taken from opegnem.org.au. And you see here the, the one for South Australia, as the state of South Australia and the NEM, the National Electricity Market. In yellow are the parts of the generation that come from solar photovoltaics. The dark yellow is the utility scale, the, the PV farms, and the um, light yellow is uh, really rooftop, all right? And you can see that we have lots of it, so much that, of course, helps decreasing the generation from fossil fuels, which is fantastic, but it can also bring a lot of challenges for the whole operation of the system, all right, which we're not gonna discuss a lot here because it's really more about the distribution networks. But of course, given that all of these solar photovoltaics, these roofs of solar photovoltaics are connected to the distribution networks, there will be challenges. There's the poles and wires that connect our homes and businesses, okay? So rooftop solar is huge in Australia and is connected obviously to distribution because these are you know, relatively small. And that means that that particular part of the power systems can be compromised in certain cases. Now, uh, what is this compromise? What are these challenges that we're talking about? This is just a little schematic of a uh, low voltage network, uh, which you have a few houses, you know, you have your low voltage feeder, your connections, single phase connected houses, your little transformer. When we design these, these little low voltage feeders, of course, we designed them for a peak demand, you know, using an after diversity maximum demand of a few kilowatts. And we make sure that, you know, the cross section of these conductors are large enough for that big demand and transformer as well, and that the corresponding impedances are not that big, that we have significant voltage drops, right? We do this around the world, nothing new. However, when we have solar photovoltaics, the sun shines to everyone, and if it's a weekday, not everyone is at home, which means we can have reverse power flows. Reverse power flows that, in general, our assets can handle, but if they are a lot, of course, we end up having higher voltages, and uh, we can have much higher currents so much that these voltages can go beyond the upper stator limit that here in Australia, for instance, is 253 volts. And if you can have a lot of reverse power flows, it means that you can have power flows that can exceed the rated capacity of your conductors or your transformers. So these are the voltage and thermal issues. Now, how are we mitigating this? I mean, this is not news for most of you perhaps that are joining uh, today and will be looking at this uh, recording as well later. Uh, we, we are addressing this, of course, you know, I mean, Australia has enriched, you know, 32 gigawatts of photovoltaics without doing anything, right? Uh, so there are many things, all right? So for instance, there, the offload tap changer, you know, it can be changed in position to regulate voltages. Uh, you can also use effectively the PV inverter functions or the PV inverter response modes. So we're talking about volt watt functions, volt bar functions, and specific settings that can actually be very, very useful. So we are exploiting this a lot. Our standards are perhaps some of the best uh, in the world in the sense that really exploit PV inverter functions. For now, actually, PV inverter functions, they, they need to come with a specific setting for vol, both volt bar and vol watt simultaneously. And that is pretty effective. Now, that is not enough. That's a reality. That helps, but that is not enough. Uh, we're using also what it is called fixed export limits, which means we do not allow 
a single house to export more than a given number. Actually, typically it's five kilowatts per uh, single phase house, but that number is going down and down as many neighborhoods have photovoltaics. And of course, five kilowatts can be a lot if many houses have photovoltaics. So this is helping mitigating the issues, but it is certainly not enough. On top of that, as I was mentioning, there are batteries, right? So what means that, what happens with, with these batteries? Well, people are making the most of their photovoltaics, which is great, but also you have aggregators, you know, third parties, not necessarily the distribution company, in general, not the distribution company, that are contacting, you know, these people that have batteries as well, and then say, hey, I can actually manage your, uh, technologies there behind the meter and then provide services to, for instance, the system operator, you know, energy balancing services, for instance, or for other purposes. And that's all great. This is fantastic, actually, as a matter of fact. And it is allowed for already many years here in Australia. In other countries, it is, it is not allowed or it is recent. Now, aggregators do follow the rules in terms of, you know, what they can export per, at a connection point, uh, because that is established by the distribution companies. And the system operator, of course, and society benefits from all these new resources. That is all fantastic. However, what we're seeing here is more reverse power flows, which is more voltage and thermal issues. And that's part of the challenge. So having photovoltaics and having bottom-up services means that we are having all these reverse power flows and we need to find much more effective ways of uh, orchestrating all these uh, new technologies. And this is the Australian cost. So we're moving away from fixed limits, right? So as we have more and more solar photovoltaics, the export limits are getting smaller, right? So as I was mentioning, the standard offer today is five kilowatts per phase, but in many areas with lots of photovoltaics, it's getting smaller and smaller. Now, why is this bad? Of course, that means that people, you know, might be discouraged to have solar photovoltaics uh, or, you know, aggregators might be discouraged to actually come up with very interesting uh, ways of extracting, you know, these potential services that then will help the system operate or even distribution companies as well locally. You will discuss a little bit about local services as well with Perluigi later. And in general, it's just uh, an inefficient use of the network because, I mean, as much as these fixed limits are needed, they are designed for the worst case scenario. So that very sunny day with very little demand. But what about the rest of the year, right? So it is not the greatest solution. It was a good solution and that's all right. We needed to come up with this, it, but it's not the greatest one. So in 2023, the regulator in Australia, the Australian Energy Regulator gave the okay for flexible export limits, right? As much as we are gonna talk about operating envelopes, that it is about exports and imports, the reality in Australia, uh, officially, it's only about export limits, flexible export limits, right? But uh, we are going to talk about imports as well. So distribution companies have started offering this to residential customers. So they need to opt in and they will move you know, from having these fixed limits, uh, particularly for exports, to uh, limits that are going to change. So there has to be the whole ecosystem where the photovoltaic directly or someone indirectly manages those corresponding exports according to the limits that have been calculated. Now. This is uh, just a little thing here that I, I work dynamic operating envelopes. That's the other uh, terminology that is used uh, commonly in Australia, dynamic operating envelopes or DOEs. I just prefer to say operating envelopes. It's just short, but it's the same, all right? Now, uh, there are some links there for the AER uh, document. Now, so this is a reality in Australia, and this is a world first. There's no other part in the world where actually distribution companies can set these limits, time varying limits for residential customers. And of course, what's needed here in Australia. Now let's get more into operating envelopes, the concept, the benefits and the challenges, all right? Now let's get into the concept. So what is this? So an operating envelope is a time varying export limit or import limit at the connection point of flexible customer. Now, this is important at the connection point because uh, this is how the AER, the Australian Energy Regulator also considers the flexible export limit. Now, the reality is that calculating this value at the connection point means that you need to capture as well what is happening behind the meter, not just the photovoltaics or the potential battery that's going to be used for services, but also the demand. Doing that is not simple at all, all right? So what some uh, distribution companies are doing right now, quite rightly, is actually trying to tackle the uh, technology that is widely used, which is photovoltaics. So it is really a calculation mostly for photovoltaics, more or less capturing the local demand. 
Um, and that's okay. That's okay as a transition period, but eventually we might move to really the, connect, uh, the, the, the flexible expo limit at the connection point fully. Now, that means that we're gonna call these uh, customers that have that have opted for the operating envelope for the flexible expo limit as flexible customers. The other customers uh, that might have is still photovoltaics and batteries, electricals, everything, we'll call them fixed customers. Now, the operating envelopes are calculated for a specific time. All right, so it could be in real time for the next five minutes or in advance, the next 24 hours, every five minutes or every 10 minutes, whatever it is that is needed. Of course, in Australia, the market uh, is refreshed every five minutes, all right, and then therefore the five minutes appears there. Now, why would we do it in advance? Because eventually, if it is uh, to provide some settings, you know, the maximum exports to aggregators that are playing the market, of course, they will benefit from having uh, an understanding of what might happen, what are the limits you know, in the next few hours, so they can plan the use of their assets accordingly, right? So that is why it is important also to do it in the future. Now, of course, how do you calculate it? You calculate it in a way that you capture, of course, the utilization of the assets in terms of the voltages, you know, the limits, and the corresponding capacity, right, throughout the day. So operating envelope need to capture that. But of course, data availability drives how this can be calculated because the more data that you have, if you have electrical models, you can actually come up with better ways of calculating this. The less you have, it gets a little bit more complicated. And we will discuss this in block number two. On the, on the right hand side, what you see there is a graph of how operating envelopes look for exports and imports. Uh, and what you see there is that uh, if for a given time step, you know, the, the different customers, they have kind of the same values, right? For a given time step, this is what we call equal allocation. I will discuss this a little bit later. So this is just for graphically uh, to, to understand these operating envelopes. Now, in terms of the concept, the idea is, you know, once you calculate these operating envelopes, you know, for the corresponding distributed energy resources or at the meter level, right, at the connection point, then you broadcast this to the actual photovoltaic systems or the aggregators, depending on what is your implementation. And then of course, the corresponding photovoltaic systems, they will act accordingly or the aggregator decides how to act on behalf of the customer, right? And what do we get with this? Well, of course, it means that the, the available capacity at that moment in time will be utilized fully by the corresponding distributed resources. We can unlock bottom-up services that can help, you know, as I was mentioning, the system operator. And we ensure network integrity. We ensure that the distribution network is okay, the poles and wires are okay. And that's very, very important. What are the benefits? So I produced this slide here to show you a little bit of the benefits looking at a customer. So these are the exports of a customer in a simulation that uh, we were doing, you know, that we are gonna show us some more results uh, in the next hour. So what you can see here, this is a customer that doesn't have a lot of demand necessarily, otherwise wouldn't be exporting. <laughs> and in this case, uh, what we see is that with the operating envelopes, they are exporting more. And with the 1.5 kilowatt fixed export limit, of course, there's a flat line that doesn't go beyond that 1.5, right? Now, this is an 8 kVA PV system, all right? So a customer with an 8 kVA PV system. In terms of energy for this particular sunny day, what we have is 120% more energy exported for the day. This is huge. That doesn't happen every day, of course, because the sun changes, <laughs> changes you know, its irradiance and the demand changes. But this just shows how much bigger is the ability with operating envelopes for us to extract this photovoltaic generation. Now, of course, if you have a much smaller photovoltaic system, let's say a 3.5 kVA, perhaps this customer will not necessarily benefit as much. And this is important also to understand, right? But there is always a benefit. And this is a simulation that was done, of course, with electrical networks, et cetera, et cetera. So what I want to highlight here with this particular slide is that operating envelopes can unlock much more PV generation with the same poles and wires. Of course, we require a infrastructure, an IT infrastructure to actually calculate things, collect data, send data, et cetera. And this is not simple at all. The system operator uh, and the society benefits from more resources, from new resources, which eventually means what? Lower emissions, cheaper electricity, new services, and many operational opportunities. Because the moment that you have the ability to change these limits, uh, not just because of the poles and wires, but perhaps we lost a massive generator or a massive transmission line. So, the system operator can actually tell the distribution companies to create new limits to actually help the whole operation of the system. So there are many, many opportunities, some of which are gonna be discussed as well with Perlui later in block three. 
So this is the only slide I have in benefits. I hope that uh, this is clear, but there are many other things that actually uh, operating loss can help. And there are many other quantifications that we're gonna be discussing as well. Now, in terms of the challenges, there are many challenges, all right? So, but let's focus first on the calculation challenges. Uh, so for you to really uh, handle, you know, all these, these written resources, solar photovoltaics or bottom up services, you first need to understand what is the demand and generation of those customers not managed by aggregators, all right, that are not going to participate in these flexible exports, for instance. Why? Because you need to understand what will happen to the network considering them, all right? So that means that you require that visibility. So in this particular example, for instance, at noon, you know that you have just the suppose that you have a maximum, you know, 15 kilowatts, you know, of uh, rated capacity for that part of your little uh, low voltage feeder. And uh, of course, if two uh, houses are already exporting, you know, a total of eight, it means that you can only export seven, right? But at night, so the other two houses might be importing eight, which means now you can actually export much more. So that means that you need data of what is happening with other customers, right? That's the first thing, right? So the local demand increases, flexible exports, you know, the feasible exports increase. But we mean we need observability of these passive customers or, you know, these non-flexible customers. Now, location matters as well. Why? Because if you are going to calculate how much you can export in this electrical circuit, well, it will depend on where you are at the very end of that feeder or very close to the transformer. Why? Because the impedance matters. And this is, of course, for electrical engineers. Uh, this is an electrical circuit at the end of the day. So depending on where you are and the impedance, you will actually uh, have much more sensitivity to voltage. Now, that means that depending on the distance transformer, your experts can actually be compromised. The most important message here is that the physics need to be captured. But also, fairness needs to be in mind because it means that location already creates an unfair situation. People, it's not that you bought your house thinking that you will have more impedance with respect to the transformer, right? <laughs> um, but uh, this will have an effect, right? And you will discuss some aspects of fairness as well with period in block three. Now, there are other challenges in terms of calculating operating envelopes. Uh, if you really uh, need to capture the physics, well, then you need to produce electrical models. And to do that, you really need advanced techniques and site visits because they are not fully validated. Distribution companies around the world, as much as they are trying to make them better, they still have many, many challenges. There's a phase grouping, the corresponding impedance, the actual topology, or even the association of customers to the corresponding transformers. That data is not precise. So validating them, getting them properly to run power flows is not uh, straightforward. And again, if you really need to capture the physics to have a much more accurate calculation for operating envelope, lots of data is needed. As I was mentioning in the previous slides, you will need data. Data is coming from smart meters that not necessarily everywhere has. And uh, if, if you have for residential, you might not have it for the commercial and industrial customers. You will need additional monitors, perhaps at a distribution transformer. And you need forecasting as well, because we're talking about, you know, to calculate this ahead. Not only that, you will need novel algorithms as well that need to be fast and scalable and many other practical uh, considerations. So there, there's a massive amount of effort that is happening already in the industry in Australia to really make this happen, okay? Now, and it's not just about the calculation, all right? So there are many other things. So there are many aspects related to the infrastructure, the IT infrastructure, the communication infrastructure, the corresponding protocols, the standards, et cetera, that need to be working properly for this to happen. I won't be talking about all these challenges. I'm just gonna focus more on the conceptual aspects and the calculation aspects. But I do want to acknowledge the fact that there are many, many parts that are challenging in this implementation of operating envelopes. And certainly, you know, you will be able to, to discuss some of them with uh, Alex and Liam tomorrow as well. Let's get into the ideal calculation of operating envelopes. So, so far, I hope that you understand conceptually what is an operating envelope, but okay, so how do we calculate? I just mentioned that, well, we will run some power flows and uh, we will have perhaps some uh, uh, electrical models and data and then we will do this. So yes, in a sense that, but let's get a little bit more to the details, right? So if you really want to capture the physics accurately, there's no other way of doing this 
than having electrical models, all right? And that corresponding data from all the customers. So you need to map the state of the network precisely, all right? Now, having all of this is almost impossible for most distribution companies around the world, right? So what you're seeing here is what we call the gold standard, which is actually something that was done in Project Edge, and I will show you know, some slides about that. So the idea here is that if you have visibility at each moment in time of what is your voltage at the head of the low voltage here, meaning the secondary side of the transformer, three phase voltage is of course the magnitudes, you have a monitoring of the active and reactive power of the customers that are not the flexible, let's call it the passive customers. You have the reactive power of the active customer, the flexible customers. So if you have all this data and the electrical model, all right, that has to be precise, yes, it's entirely possible to actually calculate what would happen or what is needed or what is a maximum export or imports of those customers that you're calculating the operating envelope for, right? Why? Because you can just create an algorithm that's using power flows or in general, you know, the equations that capture, you know, the physics of the power flows can be linearized. Uh, you can explore what is actually going to happen if everyone exports one kilowatt, two kilowatts, four kilowatts, whatever, and then you get to the maximum before you actually hit the, or not hit, but actually exceed the voltage limits or the thermal limits, all right? And many other considerations that you can have. So that is in principle what can be done, right? The challenge with that is this is a lot of data, a lot of data that is to some extent unrealistic for many distribution companies, not just in Australia, but around the world. So there are alternatives and we're gonna discuss these alternatives with, with Arthur in, in block number two, which is great, all right? But uh, those alternatives mean less accuracy, right? And we need to understand that. This is not about trying to say what is, what is best, uh, but what is actually doable. Right, and what are the implications of that? Now, if we would want to look at how we calculate, uh, what would be the process of calculating things? So we need to acknowledge the fact that, yes, you can do this uh, in real time or see the real time near real time every five minutes with the latest data, if you have access to the data, of course. But if you are really having operating envelopes, flexible export limits, with the view that it's actually going to be useful for aggregators in particular, to then help the system operation, you know, then that means that you need to do forecast. And that's part of the challenge as well, because forecasts are, well, as our phone tells us, as well with the forecast of the weather, <laughs> never perfect, right? <laughs> Inherently, they have errors. Uh, but still, you know, we can actually calculate things relatively accurately and then use that to calculate the corresponding operating angles. So you will need the forecast or the real time information. And then you will calculate things for exports and imports separately, actually. I will discuss this a little bit later. And it, for each calculation, you will have a sort of allocation technique or objective function. And you will check you know, iteratively or with an optimization technique as well, it can be uh, what is that maximum export that allows you to really just before hitting the, the constraints, right? Or exceeding the constraints. And then you calculate the corresponding exports and imports uh, as operating envelopes for all the corresponding customers. Now, this iterative algorithm that I was mentioning, they, they used to explore different operating envelope values and check the network. Yeah, the so network is fine. Using a power flow analysis, it can actually be a yeah, nonlinear formulation. It can be a linearized formulation. That's what was done in uh, break edge, or even an optimal power flow. That doesn't make it iterative. It would be an optimization technique as well. But of course, all of these that I just mentioned requires the network models and that is part of the challenge. Now in terms of this iterative algorithm, what uh, needs to be done here really if, if it is not an optimization technique is really just checks. What if checks? Uh, given that we have a given state of the network at, at one moment in time, uh, the last five minutes, so that's kind of your uh, forecast for the next five minutes, or if you have the forecast for you know two hours from now, if you have the different elements, then you just start uh, assessing for the corresponding flexible customers, the what if. What if they start exporting this much, this much, and if they can still do it, then you go farther and farther and farther until you reach the corresponding limits, all right? And the idea is really to check 
the full utilization of the available capacity, not just in terms of thermal aspects, but as well in terms of voltage. So that is the idea, all right? Now, when you actually look at exports and imports, you need to do this separately, all right? Uh, why? Because they have different effects, all right? So there's an exploration, a uh, calculation for the exports, all right? So that's what the, 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 the graph at uh, the top is trying to show. And then there's a uh, exploration for imports as well, all right? Uh, that one can be very similar in terms of the exploration. You're checking voltages, you're checking you know, thermal uh, capacity, you know, where you're exceeding the thermal capacity of the assets, but they need to be separate. You cannot calculate exports and imports simultaneously because one actually uh, affects the other and uh, yet yeah, that doesn't work. So what you need to do is to assess the worst case scenario and that's why they need to be calculated separately. Now, there's another aspect that you are gonna go into a little bit more of details uh, here with uh, Pierluigi in, in block three. And uh, also affects block two in the sense that uh, different operating envelope implementations might not be able to do different allocation techniques. Now, what is an allocation technique? So as I was mentioning earlier, I was saying, oh, what if everyone exports one kilowatt and then two kilowatts and you know check the network, right? Now, why would everyone export the same amount? Well, that's a possibility, right? That is what we call equal opportunity. It could be pro rata, depending on the size of the PV inverter, for instance. Uh, larger PV inverters can export proportionally more, all right? Or be curtailed proportionally more. Uh, but the idea is that everyone more or less uh, receives proportionally the same, all right? Now, that is something that people might consider as fair, all right? However, there are other allocation principles or objective functions can use. And another one that goes into the other stream is what we call maximized services or maximized exports or maximized imports, if you want. The idea there is to favor efficiency. And by efficiency, we mean extracting as much exports in the aggregate or the neighborhood or imports uh, as possible. Now, if ultimately what we want is to make the most of PV generation in the case of exports, then of course, surely we need to go for maximized services. So for instance, here, these uh, plots now are showing you, you know, that particular area where in terms of uh, energy, you know, for the equal opportunity, you get in terms of the exports in around, what, 110 kilowatt hours, all right? For all those customers that are exporting. Whereas the maximized services is getting to 154 kilowatts for all these customers. So you can actually extract more energy if of course, you know, everyone is exporting really. Now the challenge is that the maximized services, because it's favoring efficiency, it will reduce the exports to those customers that are very sensitive to voltages particularly, which may be the house at the very end of the street. Now, is that fair? <laughs> that's another story, right? And that's not for me to decide. And you are gonna discuss this a little bit more in block three, but this is just for completeness to, to tell you that the calculation can be done in different ways and it will have very various different implications. Now, also the thing with maximizing services, because it needs to capture the corresponding sensitivity to voltages in particular, it means that you need to have a way of calculating operating envelopes that captures that, which if it is a very simplistic approach, you might not be able to do that and you will just go for equal opportunity. All right, moving on. So in the next slides, I'm gonna finish with break H and with some uh, final, uh, key remarks. And uh, of course, you know, there are some questions that I will be more than happy to go through. Now, pre-gauge is a, or was a very <laughs> big project, uh, as I was mentioning, involving, uh, well, AIMO, the Australian uh, Energy Market Operator, the system operator in Australia, Osnet Services, Mondo Power, which is a retailer, and many other organizations, including the University of Melbourne. Now, uh, before I start, I just wanted to acknowledge that this program received funding from the from Arena, all right, and that the views expressed here are not necessarily the views of the Australian government, all right, and the Australian government does have any responsibility in what I'm providing here, okay? <laughs> That's just an important disclaimer. Now, uh, there are multiple webinars of Pregage, and there's a lot of content that has been provided already in the public domain. Um, this is the page of the University of Melbourne, uh, particularly from the webinars and some of the resources that we created. 
as part of the corresponding project. So I, I encourage you to go there if you are interested. And uh, because there are multiple webinars, it means there's a lot of content. So I won't be able to go into it, right? So Project Edge, in a sense, uh, decided for the outset that uh, we'll implement the ideal calculation of operating cal uh, envelopes. Now, of course, at that time, we wouldn't call it ideal, which is uh, the most accurate that they could imagine, which was correct, using the electrical models and having a lot of monitoring. It happens, uh, for those of you that are not uh, in Australia, that Victoria has full deployment of smart meters. So all the houses here have smart meters, all the uh, commercial and industrial have, have smart meters. Now, distribution companies have normally access, their access to the residential smart meter data, not necessarily the commercial and industrial. But still, in a very residential area, it means that they have all the smart meter data uh, and they can access it. So that's great. Uh, Osnet was in a position where they had, you know, pretty okay electrical models, but they were not validated. So we needed to go through a process of validation, of checking topology, phase groups, and impedances. And that was a little bit painful, all right? Because uh, we were not expecting that there were so many little errors in, here and there. Not because of Osnet, that's normally of many distribution companies in Australia and around the world. Uh, there was no need to keep track of the actual uh, electrical properties in detail. So they have a pretty decent idea, but it's not necessarily perfect. And validating this was really time time consuming, but it is possible to validate things. So for instance, these plots are showing here in red are the comparison of calculating the voltages uh, with the smart meter data, right? Active and reactive power and the corresponding voltage of the transformer, we were having monitors there. Uh, with the electrical models that were not validated. So you can see that the, the red dots were not necessarily that great for side G or for side A. But the moment that we validated uh, the electrical models, there were side VCs, there were some techniques that we use with the data, and we improved impedances, topology, et cetera. Uh, you can see that the green uh, dots uh, are matching much nicer, you know, the corresponding, uh, the calculation with the corresponding smart meter data in terms of voltages. So it is possible to validate them, but it can be very time consuming. And then the question mark is where this is scalable enough for thousands and thousands of low voltage networks, right? But it was done in, in, in pre-gauge, not just for low voltage networks, three-phase low voltage networks, it was done for swear networks of all the single wire air return, which are rural networks are pretty common in Victoria. Now, there were multiple use cases, right? It wasn't just about the active power services, you know, that the, the operating loss and exports, you know, uh, they were demonstrating the trials. We also demonstrated reactive power services and also some optimization techniques as to using all local changes, for instance, to improve, you know, the capabilities uh, of exporting more or importing more and as well, incorporating the aggregators schedule. So there are different things that were done. I'm not gonna be able to go into details here because we're finishing block one as a, a higher overview of what uh, Project Edge was doing and everything about the concept of operating members. But this is just for completeness. I would encourage you to go to the different webinars and the material that we have. And they're very interesting reports. Now, how do these operating envelopes look like in particular, you know, for, for Project Edge? So this is one of the sites that we call site A. You can see there are multiple customers. The colors there are referring to the corresponding faces. So we're calling them face red, uh, green, and blue. We have two feeders departing the transformer. And we have some customers, those that are actually with underscore or underline. Those are the customers that uh, they are flexible customers. So we're calculating the operating envelopes for them. Now, this calculation here is what we call a hindsight calculation. So uh, this is already, you have the, the metering data and then you're calculating what will happen there in those cases. So you can assume it's the same as perfect forecasting in a way, right? And uh, what we're showing here is that there are networks, site A for instance, that are extremely robust. So the impedances are pretty small and uh, the capacity is pretty good. So really, you know, you can really make the most of that. In this case, we were limiting the export limits uh, to 10 kilowatts and, and the imports was around 14. So that's why they are pretty much, you know, using the limits, right? Now, why did we bother with operating envelopes in this site? Well, it was one of the sites and this was one of the most modern uh, designs uh, in, in the different sites that we consider, but you can see that actually the operating envelopes, they do change significantly in other sites. So this is for instance, site E. Site E here is a SWER network, again, a rural network, and you can see how the exports and the imports can actually change dramatically, even 
down to uh, zero for some exports in some cases, depending again of the conditions of that particular moment in time, what the other neighbors are doing, how the network is actually behaving in terms of voltages. So many, many factors. So this just demonstrates that operating envelopes can actually be calculated precisely, but these are hindsight operating envelopes, all right? In the trial, there was the component of forecast that was done by another company to really test the, the, the whole operating envelope concept implemented by OSNET services as well, all right? And in this case, well, the forecast was one of the challenges that uh, we had as a whole project as well, that just demonstrates that there's more work that is needed. So you can see here in the different sites, sites A, C, D, and E, the forecasts are in red and the actual voltages here in this case, that they are forecast for active power, active power, and I cannot show everything because otherwise <laughs> we need another hour just for project age. Uh, you can see how the, the forecasts are just way off in some cases, and in some cases kind of not that bad, all right? What does this mean? If, if you have really inputs that are not adequate, of course, your operating envelopes are gonna be way off. And this is exactly what was happening. So in this plot, what we're trying to show just for one of the sites is the operating envelope using the forecast, which is in terms of exports, the blue line that is on top is saying that, well, the network is super capable. So this particular customer can actually export uh, 10 kilowatts uh, every time. Whereas actually the moment that we really look at the data and what actually happened in terms of demand and generation and voltages, well, the customer shouldn't have been given that operating envelope because uh, it was very, very little that was possible to do in some cases and sometimes zero. And this is part of the challenge with operating envelopes. It's not just the calculation that I was mentioning as an ideal calculation with electrical models and all the data that you need, but forecasts are going to be a very important component as well to get it right. And uh, well, as any other challenge, we will need to address it, of course, but uh, there will be limitations and we need to accept that. That any, no, There's no forecast that will be perfect for sure, but well, no, certainly there's more work that needs to be done uh, compared to what we were doing in break age, of course. And that just highlights one of the many challenges that the industry needs to address. Now, just to finish uh, and then just have a few minutes with the Q&A and then the little break before we go. Two, just some points as key remarks. Uh, so first of all, the operating envelopes can bring significant benefits. I hope that that's clear to everyone here. Uh, the idea is really to unlock more PV generation, more services. And of course, with this, we're gonna lower the emissions of the electricity sector or cheaper electricity as well, and many other potential benefits. Now, producing precise operating envelopes is a very tough business. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. To start with, if you really want to go precise, you need electrical models that are not necessarily available. You need good algorithms and you need very good forecasts. And that is uh, also a challenge. Now, the validation of electrical models is possible, as we were showing, you know, with, with Project Edge, but this requires a lot of data and can be extremely time consuming and labor intensive. So we need to be very careful with that. So alternatives are needed. And this is what we're going to discuss in block two with Arthur. Now, conceptually, the operating envelopes, the calculation is straightforward. I hope that it is pretty clear, you know, what it is needed eventually. And of course, we will discuss the actual calculation, you know, with algorithms, the actual code uh, tomorrow in block three uh, with a hands-on experience. Uh, but still, there are many considerations. You know, what happens when you have, you know, different uh, assets uh, in terms of, you know, certain networks is different from the low, three-phase low voltage or a three-phase customer is different from a single-phase customer. What happens with the reactive power aspects? So there are many practical considerations that of course I couldn't you know, address here today in block one because it's more conceptual and more introductory. And forecast of course is something that we still need to put some effort. Now, uh, this is where I stop with my key remarks. Uh, we will be sharing the slides of course. There are multiple links here, not just with break age, flexible export limits, which is a project you know, from SAPAN. Um, what is right now, for instance, EnergyX offering in terms of flexible limits, PV inverter functions for you to go a little bit farther, you know, with standards that we have here in Australia, interoperability aspects, for instance, the CSIP uh, Australia, the common smart meter, smart inverter profile, which is very important, you know, for interoperability. So there are many aspects that are associated with operating envelopes. So with that, I just wanted to thank, uh, of course, uh, not just Universal Melbourne, Arena, Emos, Net, H, and a lot of people that were working on this. I'm, I'm more than happy to answer questions. So I'm gonna go through the questions super quick, and then we will have a tiny break. Uh, is the 
I think the dynamic operating envelopes is important. We need to use uh, wearing trap into long wave framing. Well, I mean, uh, Tim, to be very honest with you, I, I just dislike uh, long term. <laughs> I prefer just operating envelopes. But at, at the end of the day, this is just uh, uh, a, 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 a preference. Um, the AER doesn't call it operating envelopes, just flexible experiments, for instance. Um, Claire is asking, what happens if a customer opts in flexible but also uses an aggregator services? Do the NSPs have a view of who uses aggregator services by third party? No. Uh, the, what happens behind the meter uh, is entirely up to the customer. All right. So if you want to engage with an aggregator, it's entirely up to you. Now, ideally, the, or in the future, the distribution companies will provide that um, flexible export limit at the connection point to the aggregator. That's what PregH did, all right? And what is that some projects are trying to, to, to do as well. But naturally, uh, because of the calculation and the challenges, what it can happen in the, in the interim is that that calculation will be done directly for the PV inverter, all right? That's the exports of the PV. Um, now, again, it will be a third party. It can be an aggregator. It can be just a manager of your resources. So uh, that's entirely up to you. Uh, someone needs to, to, to sign up to that provider uh, so it can actually take an action. Now, DNSPs, distribution companies in Australia can also go directly to the PV inverter and do that uh, change in the setting as well. Uh, that is something that can be an option as well, but in general, the idea would be for a third party to do it. Now, uh, we have Almin, Almin, is a calculation based on historical data? No, uh, the calculation should be for the future. Right, so if it's uh, it's just for the future, right? Because this is for aggregators uh, who is providing services, or if it's for real time as as well. If it is real time, you just need the corresponding data that is recently. But of course, how do you calculate forecast? Forecast require all data, right? <laughs> historical data. So the calculation is done with historical data because of the forecast, but it's not that the historical data limits the. I mean, it's, it's just the historical data is used. You need a forecast, right? Um, there's anonymous that means the frequency of thermometer data is required to calculate operating loss. Yes, of course. So uh, it depends on what the data that you require. So if we're talking about real time and you have access of, to the thermometer data only every six hours, well, that's not very real time, right? <laughs> uh, if you're looking at the forecast, perhaps, you know, the, those last six hours, you know, already, you know, compromise your forecast for the next two hours, right? So yes, a smart meter data that is relatively frequent and recent is key, all right? In pre age, it was used every five minutes and uh, was used actually the most uh, uh, updated database in terms of the smart meter data, because actually depending on the distribution company, they will refresh the availability of the smart meter data every number of hours. It can be six hours, it can be two hours. So it's not that they refresh it uh, every minute, for instance, okay? But yes, you need uh, granular and uh, relatively recent. Is the smart meter data sufficient uh, to accurately calculate operating envelopes? Uh, well, or you need transformer monitoring. So the, the, the most complete way would be with a transformer monitoring, particularly if uh, you're running power flows because you need a Slack bus, right? However, what, uh, you know, remember power flows, you need a slack bus, you need a reference voltage, but what happens if you are actually uh, having, you're, you're very lucky that you have a customer, smart meters that is very close to the transformer. So that's a proxy, all right? So you can use that. So not in all cases, transformer monitoring is needed, but in some cases it can be. And you will discuss some of these implementations actually with Alex and uh, Liam tomorrow as well. Uh, Tim, we'll consider the impact of community batteries as stories on DOA calculation on operation. Uh, you need to consider everything that is in the network, uh, Tim. So if we are talking about uh, there's a capacitor bank here or there's a voltage regulator that is doing something uh, very actively changing voltages, you, you need to consider the network, right? So anything that changes the state of the network needs to be considered. And that's the challenge with a very precise calculation because you need data, you need, you need to know everything that is happening. Now, uh, a much simpler approach, of course, will require less data, but it will be compromised in this accuracy. And this will be, dis be discussed in the next uh, block with ARSA. It would be interesting to see how much loss there is for an uh, 11 kV underground network due to charging current. Yes, I mean, uh, we, we didn't quantify losses, but yes, for sure, there, there, there will be other aspects to that because of the reverse power flows. 
Um, how will this operating envelope calculation factors in the addition of small scale wind turbines? Uh, no, we, we didn't consider at all the small scale wind turbines, but I mean, again, it's just data, right? So it's similar to PV generation, wind turbines will be generation, but it will happen in different times of the day, but the operating envelopes are for every time of the day. So uh, it's just data. If you have the data, you will capture that. Um, uh, Travis saying this doesn't seem so impossible. Yes, that's correct. It is actually happening tomorrow. You're going to hear from Energy Queensland and uh, SAPAN as well. Um, but the, the interesting thing that you're going to hear tomorrow from Energy Queensland and from SAPAN is that they don't have full smart meter coverage as we have in Victoria, for instance. And, but they came up you know, with other techniques. So it is totally doable. Um, and and uh, there, are, there are very interesting possibilities. I agree with that there is. Um, the limitation on data availability and the process quantity. Well, again, you know, the limitations are really in terms of how precise you want to be. If you be as precise as what I was describing as the ideal calculation, uh, of course, you know, you need electrical models and that's almost impossible to get it right. And you need data from all the customers, even those that are not going to sign up for flexible export limits. Uh, and then that's sometimes difficult because some distribution companies don't have it. But if you're going to go for an approximated approach, totally doable. And again, uh, you will hear from Energy Queensland and SAPAN tomorrow. I'm totally global, absolutely. Uh, through your experience, what are the different percentages of limits reach close to reaching the different checks in slide 26? Well, I mean, uh, it all depends on, on, on the data that you have and the forecast that you have. So we're gonna discuss uh, this breaching limits with Arthur actually in the next block, uh, but without forecast. So even if you add forecast, then you, it will be even worse, but you will see the results uh, in the next block. And there's another question. Can you have the best of both worlds, maximum service? No, you cannot, period. That's it. <laughs> you cannot have both, <laughs> unfortunately. You can tweak things, but still. And again, uh, the maximum services requires voltage sensitivities, which means more data. And in some cases, you don't have that. Well, what is the color coding of those charts? Not entirely sure, Tim, what are you referring to? Uh, uh, real time should mention that uh, smart meters in big are not real time data. Well, yes, uh, they are not real-time data. They could be if they wish to do so, uh, but uh, right now they are not. They are batching in six hours, uh, actually, as a matter of fact. Um, what does a yellow box mean on red slide 31? Uh, 31, uh, 31. Oh, the yellow box is that uh, actually it was in fish. That, 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 that's what that yellow box means. So site F was in completely done. Right, <laughs> that's, 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 the, that's the, the, the answer. Um, uh, so explanation, what about using ADMM technique? Uh, I guess that you're referring to uh, um, the multiplier system optimization technique. Uh, well, I mean, sure, but again, you need electrical models, which if you don't have, there's nothing to do there. Um, I noticed it's like 34 uh, shows, uh, shows, Overhead lines, crews with short arms. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, really, there is imbalance due to overhead uh, crews with short arms. Okay, well, I mean, there, 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 there can be imbalances, of course. Uh, but I mean, we, these are these are operating envelopes calculated calculated with three phase electrical models and with a corresponding power flow. So we are actually capturing for imbalance all the time as well. Um, I am aware of the time right now. So unfortunately I will need to stop here with the questions and I will try to make my best to answer them on the discussion board. So I'm gonna just give us a couple of minutes of a break and then we will start in two minutes. So I'm gonna stop here the corresponding uh, recording. Thank you. <laughs>